Yeah, welcome to everybody and uh, and cheers. Um, so as as Tom said, we do run these sessions uh, in person now and again, and we also through the lockdowns we do quite a few virtual ones in our social distance in, but generally they are recorded oh, wow. somewhere, nattering about something. We don't have an agenda or a topic, <clears throat> just talking about something uh, in the time it takes us to drink a pint of something. Record it, stick it out on the internet, and somehow people seem to, uh, to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, we don't have a theme or a topic in mind. One of the things that we were asking to do in the breakout rooms was to have a chat, think about some topics that are going on that we might be interested in talking a little bit more about or hearing more or less natter about. We uh, usually explain what we're drinking and where we are. So this, my background is a pub in my hometown, Cheltenham. It's called The Restoration, and it was, um, a, a teenage haunt of mine. It's over 350 years old. It's the older pub in Cheltenham, actually. And um, I'm drinking uh, this, which is a collaboration between Brewdog and a mental health charity called SAD AF. Now, to me, AF stands for something different than, uh, than what it means on the tin. And um, what it means on the tin is the alcohol free. Um, so I've got a case of this. It's um, to, the hashtag is I am whole. It's about promoting mental health. And um, in particular, seasonal affective disorder, which affects me a lot of time of year. So, cheers. What have you got, Mr. Goddard? Uh, well, as Jeff will know, um, I'm doing dry January and I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> uh, so, I've got um, it is, it's a Copperberg, a little, I'm a big cider drinker, so if you can see that's a little, little Copperberg mixed berry alcohol free cider. I think obviously, yeah, it's um, it just tastes like fizzy Ribena, really. So it's um, it's very, it's like a, a child's, like a child's drink, really. So um, yeah, that's 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 what I'm on tonight. My little... and, uh, for in the chat, it is indeed a bespoke Agile podcast glass. Very nice. Available with with other merchandise like the Agile podcast bottle. Can we get one? Can um, we go on the go on website and order them? Yeah, you can. Yeah, cool. That com. Um. So yeah, the the how whatever you want to talk about, let us know in the chat. We'll just yeah. we'll have a little bit of small talk while you while you have a think about that. Um, so what's uh, where, where are you? What's that pub? You don't know, Paul, do you? I don't know where the pub is. Um, we were trying to work work it out by deduction. There's a very stationary bar barman behind me who's not 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 moved at all. If people zoom in really closely on my um, on the bar, there is some reference to. London or the Thames, I think. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a, a, a stole the photo from Google, so I'm not sure where it is. I was imagining that some of the, the, the conversation today would be around the restrictions changing tomorrow. Uh, I imagine that's on people's minds. I got that wrong today. <laughs> I thought it was today that restrictions had changed. So I got on the bus and I got on the train without a mask on. Why has everyone still got their masks? I thought, I thought this had changed. Um, and then I, so I Googled it and I realised it was tomorrow and I thought, well, I can't put my mask on now because I've been sat on the train for 15 minutes. And I basically made my stand of, I'm medically exempt, therefore that's why I'm not wearing a mask. Putting a mask on now would make me look silly. So uh, I, I stuck it out for the next 15 minutes, but then wore it on the way back. But I think, because I checked, I, I looked at the BBC website today, I think the guidance for, the guidance for working from home has changed. So that's already changed, I think. But it's the masks on public transport and stuff and the shops that changes tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, that changed last week, didn't it? Yeah. Working from home changed on the day that it got announced, didn't it? Yes, it was pretty immediate, that was, yeah. So there's, for me, that, that, was, that was a confusing thing. Confusing message. Around the transparency. So I guess, so if they were going to increase the restrictions, then having some advance warning, I think, is quite useful because people don't want to get caught out. Mm. But if you're reducing the restrictions, why is advance warning necessary? Mm. Like you're going to get caught doing something. Um, so that just confused people. There we go. So yeah, I, I, I presume most of you are still working from home. Any of you? Thumbs up if you are going back to the office or... Thinking about going back to the office now, restrictions have changed. Nobody. Sort of, maybe. Most people know. 
It's probably uh, hybrid working for us all, isn't it? Well, so that's that's the term, isn't it? But I don't. I think hybrid working is going to be different for everyone, isn't it? Yeah, I think the company I work for are, uh, are kind of saying that office work is now um, now possible, so you can go back into the office because the, the guidance changed, but the, the company has still got their own kind of guidelines, and, and one of which is, you know, limit large gatherings of people. And I, I kind of see that as the only real advantage of going to the office is having those kind of face-to-face -face interactions with larger groups. So actually, the, the appeal to go into the office isn't really there for me until the, the, the company's guidance changes. Yeah. Would, would large be seven? I, I guess it's, it's open to their interpretation, but I, I, I guess any more than four they're kind of suggesting is, is a large group. Yeah. I think it also depends on your, the layout of your office, doesn't it, as well? The idea that, you know, if you've got large open plan areas and big spacious high ceilinged meeting rooms then you generally will feel less less claustrophobic anyway and i think you know that will probably have a bearing on it a company you can go back into the office but you can't book a meeting room or a collaboration space for more than an hour okay limited by time that could be an interesting constraint, though, right? Rather than how long how long is this going to take, it's how much can we do in an hour. It's about focus, isn't it? Oh, We've only got an hour, got to use it effectively. Absolute time boxing. Yeah. yeah. We used to find that people banging on the door. We've booked this meeting. Get out. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you forget about those things. You still have them. There was a. I don't know if it's true or not, but there was um. Someone told me it might be a kind of one of these urban myths that in Amazon they um, they instituted a a kind of a lean canvas policy for for meeting room bookings. So if you really wanted the meeting room, you'd have to basically fill out a fifteen minute lean canvas in order to justify its booking. And they found that you know pe people just didn't bother. So there's loads of meeting room space because people couldn't be bothered to, to go through the process. and didn't really want the room that much. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. It's one of those stories. What were the consequences? Consequences of what? Well, so I could imagine there would be upsides to that, fewer unnecessary meetings. But you yeah. could imagine some downsides where people who could have benefited from being in a room together didn't. Yeah, we'll just go, we'll go for a walk, go elsewhere. It's not a bad thing. So, I mean, for me, I, I, like, the, I like the experimental nature of it. I'd like to know what the what the hypothesis was and whether it was proven. I suppose it was yes, to cut down on the unnecessary meetings. The idea if you can't justify why you need a meeting on a, in 15 minutes, then you don't really need the meeting. Inversely, you can see that if there's an open meeting room, then you just jump in it. <laughs> yeah. So if that's not top of the agenda, because you're all going to be staying at home and you have been staying at home anyway. What else is what else is hot news, hot topics for people in North Anthony? Any questions? Any any hot potatoes to throw in there? I guess one of the one of the biggest issues, isn't it, by being remote is I suppose the engagement thing is I suppose like the cameras on thing and you don't I don't think people are maybe potentially not as engaged maybe being remote I mean I was about to say exactly it's, the same it's, thing it's, 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 it's... Aaron? yeah so uh, it's it's been a constant struggle for the last two years yeah. keeping people engaged in meetings mm. and uh, you always know when they're not is when you refer to them and go sorry I missed that what is it <laughs> because they're off doing something else on their iPhone, whatever. Yeah. And uh, are there any little tools, I guess, for keeping people e engaged in meetings? And it was harder for us, actually, for the first year at Barclays. The network didn't cope, so we couldn't have video on at all. So they could be doing whatever in their PJs, boxer shorts, dancing around, who knows? But uh... Yeah. My son, actually, um, he, he was struggling with one of his lessons, and so... We know somebody out out of school who uh, 
the same GCSEs, who offered some one-to-one -to -one sort of tuition. And I picked him up from it the other day. And I said, how was it? He said, it was really good. Uh, he said, she kind of, she explained stuff, which was good. But she also knew when I was zoning out. And so she, she brought me back. So in the classroom, they'll be talking to somebody else. And I, I just, I'll zone out. And I, I don't realize I've zoned out. And like, like 20 minutes have gone by. So, but in that, she knew when I was zoning out. And, and brought me back with a question. And I think that's that's the hard thing. Is in, a, in a room, you can, it's not about sensing. I don't think it's a spider sense thing. I just, you just got more cues to notice. Um, well, the snoring used to be a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the best facilitation tips that I heard was um, if you want to make sure someone's engaged, before you start talking around that subject, you'd say, um, so we're going to, I'm going to start talking about this or I'm going to mention this topic and Darren I'd like to come back to you when I finish talking to hear what you really think so you you actually kind of call someone out before you've started talking about it and then they're pretty much tuned into exactly everything you're saying when, when and they know you're waiting for you to finish so it's quite it's, it's a bit it's more individual but it certainly helps focus that that person on what you're saying well that's I, I, I like that technique it it reminds me of that. Well, it was while I was doing some, maybe some, uh, some kind of neurosciencey NLP type training or something like that. That was talking about different areas of the brain and how even in a really noisy room, you can hear your name being mentioned across the room mm. because it flags something and it gets your attention, uh, and you then lose focus in whatever conversation you were having because you just know someone over there was talking about it. Yeah, and and that whatever triggers there are, because it's not just your name, it's anything that you're interested in, really. And so there are probably a number of hot trigger words that you could, you know, Darren Brands or whatever, could drop in subtly that will keep people not on their toes, but just keep activating that part of the brain. But I, my general tactic is short and sharp. A lot, keep things not very, very short, and then move on to another thing, and then move on to another thing, and then wrap up and summarise or something like that. But I, so we were just talking beforehand. I haven't, I experimented with Zoom training um, and I don't do it. I don't like it. Um, it went okay, but I don't like it. Paul's doing both. He's in the middle of an A-B test at the moment. So we did a, an in-person one maybe Tuesday and he's doing a virtual one Thursday, Friday to see what the appetite is. I've, I've done virtual one-to-one -one coaching since before the pandemic over Zoom and that worked brilliantly. In fact, there were, there were a number of advantages to that for me um, but training not so much workshops not so much mm. i've turned down a lot of work because i'm pretty convinced it won't work uh, virtually so i was asked to do a, a ways of working workshop which wanted to get at the root of basically these groups of people who weren't collaborating particularly well with the conflict uh, and i just didn't think that would be resolved with everybody on Zoom and over the camera. Um, so I turned it down. Um, the, yeah. What made you decide, what made you think it was going to resolve? Um, what was it? Was there something more there than just the fact that there were? Well, um, so, yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there, are some, there are some flags there that I can't share, but in, in general, the, the, the dynamics that I was, I was in about uh, the behaviours and the engagement, I would, I would feel would need a lot more trust, a lot more trust to be built. So I, I think trust in general is lower when you, you don't have physical proximity and you don't have physical contact. Um, so I think if you've got a well-established group, then they will make things work. They will find ways around barriers. And I think that will only get better over time. And I think it's got significantly better because it had to get significantly better in the last 18 months, but there's still a hell of a long way to go. Hell of a long way to go. 
And I, I, my worry, so talking about this engagement thing, is having been part of teams and organisations when this all started kicking off and seeing it throughout, I've seen engagement levels. I, I wish I'd sort of tracked it somehow. I'm sure some people have. Engagement levels drop significantly over the last 18 months because the honeymoon period is worn off. People are getting a bit fed up with it. The exceptions that they were making, the concentration they were making, it wasn't sustainable for the long term. And then, um, you know, I was saying to Paul, I was reading an article um, by someone who was predicting that, well, 2022 is going to be the year of the employee because they can basically demand whatever working conditions they want at the moment. There's, there's more jobs than people. And, employers are, are struggling to offer whatever they can to get talent. She's worried that 2023 is going to be the year of what she calls the employer regret because they're going to be saddled with very, very flexible working policies and ineffective, inefficient processes and disengaged, isolated people. But it, once you've got them out of the office, it's going to be very difficult to get them back. Um, and I don't know whether there's truth to that. But she was citing a number of studies around engagement, productivity, morale that were a bit worrying if that's going to be the trend. I think a lot of it is also is novelty. Well, for me, as, as someone who I was really looking forward this week to, to, to driving to Cardiff, <laughs> just, be, <laughs> just because not because it's Cardiff, just because it's a oh, it's a day out. It's oh, I've got a trip to I've got a, a little journey to do. And I can, you know, do the things that I used to do. I could put my he headphones in and listen to music or whatever in the car and stuff and listen to a, a podcast on the way and go out for dinner and all these things that I think there's, um, I think there's an element of that that, that people will miss. The, the idea of the social, the um, the time, you know, the journey to get, even the journey to get to work, the walk, or whatever it is, the cycle, the, the, uh, the commute. Yes, it can be painful. I appreciate that, but there's um, there is a benefit to that. I, w I remember being on a course a long time ago in BT, and that the I can't remember what the course was, but one thing I remember is it takes twenty minutes to decompress the day, uh, and your journey home is a great way to do that. And the difference now for me, and and probably many of us, is that our work is is not twenty minutes from our home. It, it's become the same place. So. From a work aspect, great, you're getting more work done because you're at home. But me personally, I'm finding it very difficult to separate the two sometimes. And and the lines have become very blurred and I'll be checking my emails well into the evenings and I'll be getting up early first uh, first thing in the morning. The first thing I'm doing is turning my machine on at 7am, which I would never have done before. So the lines are becoming a lot more blurred. And, and for me, that it was refreshing, maybe not... It's not going to be every day for me, but just to make have a journey to go somewhere, do something, um, and and to change things up a bit. I think it seems that certain companies seem to be hemorrhaging certain roles because they're not offering fully remote as well. But it seems there's obviously it seems that there's patterns in the sorts of people that are are, are moving on for that reason. Um, but yeah, I mean, we we've lost a lot of people in certain roles for that mm. reason who, yeah. have who have moved into roles where companies are often fully remote yeah so a lot of good talent as well mm. yeah but there's mm. talent I don't, I don't know the answer to this but i have a i have a, a suspicion that some of that talent while being very valuable in many ways to that organization may well never be a valuable member of an agile team because one of the reasons they want to be fully remote is they, they want to work on their own. They don't want to be part of a collaborative team who rely on one another and work with one another to evolve something. Um, and that's not to say that they're bad or bad employees or not bad at all, but it, it is a way of perhaps self-selecting into a, an environment that is more suitable to your personality, perhaps. Do you, do you have a gut feel of I mean, it's, I suppose it's difficult to say, you know, gut feel policy is that it should be a percentage split, but do you have a gut feel based on experience of what a good policy would be? Not as a not, not percentage, it might just be, you know, 
you know, use use your, use your discretion to come in when it's it seems like uh, an opportunity when you need to come in. Yeah. What what would a what would a policy look like? Would to treat everybody different for treating the same. So, if I was running a company and I had um, I had a product development team, my belief is that an agile approach is the best way to build and develop a new product. So I wouldn't want all those people spread all over the world. I would want, if I could, I would want people in the same time zone in the same place. But if I had work that didn't require collaboration, then I would want the best people wherever they are. And I think every organization is going to have a mix of this, which kind of brings me on to Ian's question. Let's see, let's see if I can link that which is around working in an organization that's, that's trying to stay and worried that the, the organizational culture will really change and carry on. Mm -hmm. and, and without wishing to uh, invite any kind of legal challenge, <laughs> I, would say, I would probably say that my, my suspicions would be similar to yours here. And my, my suggestion for leaders uh, is to is to try and get some kind of very visualization of the organizational culture now uh, work out what kind of organizational culture they think is appropriate for the space that they're in and then get as much real-time data as they possibly can to test whether the changes they're making are creating more stories that map to that new culture or more stories that map to the old culture. Now, there are ways of doing that. They're not included within SAFE, um, but there are ways of doing that. Um, and that kind of transparency, um, and so there was a really good sort of answer in there, which was you know, talk to them about what, what, their, what their beliefs are, what their views are, what their values are, what they're hoping to get from this. And that sense of transparency, I think, would, would come back to that previous question for me. If I'm hiring somebody, if I was in that hiring position, I'll be saying that this, th these are the beliefs. This is how we operate. This is how we believe we're going to deliver value. So if you're going to join this organization, this is, this is what we kind of want from you. Are you happy with that? Um, now, a lot of people in their current organizations probably didn't have that conversation. So I feel for that, that this is an opportunity to rebalance them. Or you know a company that's hiring purely physically yeah and um they're really struggling with it um because like you said jeff um employees are, are demanding are demanding and there is plenty of other options which provide flexible working i think so i know another company that's that's been recruiting all the way through the pandemic um but they they had a pretty firm i, I wouldn't i wouldn't say it's as firm as the this other company but they wanted to hire hire people with the intention of saying, largely by default, we are an in-person on-site company. Okay, we value people being in the office, regardless really of their roles, I think. But that what they said was that you've got to try and anticipate and assume um, by default, we're, we, we'd like to, we want to be an on-site company. But with we have we can be flexible if we need to be okay so if you need to be at home to take a parcel delivery on a friday you know be at home on a friday but i think the um the the overwhelming drive was not exclusively but by by and large you're going to be you're going to be face to face with people in the office every day if we can now for me the key is have, has the rationale for that been explained? And does it make sense? Does it land? Yeah, I think it has, yeah. And what we see mostly in the news, right, is banks have told their workers they have to come back to the office. Now, if the message is, you're coming back to the office, regardless, just do it. You are, you are an employee, we, you are contracted to, we want you to, therefore you will. Then even if it's the right thing, it will be resisted. Um, and that to me smacks of, we don't trust you. Mm. 
which would then lead to a distrustful relationship. But if it's a case of, well, it's Paul saying that, we understand things are, things are difficult, things have changed, and we're flexible, but this is, this is what we need to be successful as an organisation. Yeah. And I think that's a fair conversation to have. I think you'll see these organisations, some will come out of this and they will, they will fail because they haven't approached it correctly. Some will not be able to replace the people they've got. Some will go too far the other way. Um, and some people will probably make decisions that go too far the other way because that's what we do. Uh, and then it will settle down. And when it does settle down, there will be some organisations that are in a much better place, some organisations that are in a terrible place, and others that will be able to learn from their lessons such as the way of the other adopters. We have uh, another question from Josh. Um, wanting to move from developer to project manager. So you've done that, Paul. <laughs> Paul used to be a Java developer. I was an amazing Java developer. Well, when, when, boss... Paul, joined, when Paul joined our team, our boss described him as a Java guru. I was like the savior of, of death. <laughs> I was described as, uh, yeah, come, I was coming to, from Cardiff to Exeter or to Bristol. Big money transfer was, in the world of BT. I was, uh, I was going to save that team and bring them into the, the, the time, the 20th. It didn't quite work out that way, did it? <laughs> didn't, mate, no. Um, moving from developer into project management, some ways to find project management. Uh, okay. I think there's got to be a bit of a passion for it. I think there's got to be a passion for anything. So, you know, be able to explain your why. So why do you want to move? And not why do you want to get away from where you are, but why do you want to be where you want to be? Because those are two different things. Um, and then, you know, really think about yourself. Think about your answer. There's, um, there's a really good episode of Peppa Pig. I mean, all of the episodes of Peppa Pig are really good, right? but... There's one where Madame Gazelle, the, the, the nursery teacher, asks the kids what they want to be when they grow up. Uh, and one of them says, oh, I want, to be a, I want to be a police. I want to be a policeman. So, oh, yeah, that's interesting. Why do you want to be a policeman? So I can tell people what to do. <laughs> Danny, what do you want to be? I want to be a, I want to be a teacher. Okay, that's, that's really good. Why do you want to be a teacher? Because I can tell people what to do. This, and everyone wants to do a different job because they can tell people what to do, because kids can't tell people what to do. Right? They're always told what to do. Um, and that idea of, well, why do you want to be a project manager? Is it because you see, you see you want to be in control and glory and there's no bad or whatever. So what is it about that you want? And mm -hmm. then find the organization, the context, the domain that will allow you to have that. And the good thing with project management is that it spans, because I used to be a project manager as well, is that it spans industry. It's, it's kind of transferable skills in that way. So you can then, you can always find some industry that is struggling for project management um, and get some, just get whatever experience you can. Because for me, it wasn't, wasn't necessary. If I look back now, it wasn't necessary around the project. I found a lot of the projects quite boring really, but it was around the team. It was around people. I wanted to be, I wanted to help coordinate people. I think that's what, that's how I kind of got involved in that. And I found I was quite comfortable talking to people. So I think you're right, Jeff. I think, I think it depends what aspects of that role. And also, if you've got this choice, Josh, but I don't know if it's whether it's within the same company or whether you're looking broader than that at different companies, but I would pay a lot. If I was doing this again now, I would pay a lot more attention to the company that the projects were in. Um, is it the type of companies? Are they doing the types of things that I want that I want to be part of? And that will probably increase my levels of passion for it. I think that's that's how I do things differently now. The agile side of me would, would say, don't worry so much about the title. Yeah. So if you've got a job as a developer and there is the potential for this team to become more agile, then project managers. So when we were at uh, the BT, we had thousands of project managers, but we didn't have the scrum masters. And yeah, the idea of well, just, just get rid of all the project managers and hire some scrum masters. And the idea that in an agile team, you've got basically self-managing teams. So you're expecting the developers to do a lot more self-management, not just of themselves, but of their colleagues as well. 
So you have, you have the opportunity there to take more management responsibility without having to find a new role. So you can test yourself, you can grow your skills, you can get some experience, you can prove to other people that you can take this kind of responsibility, you can do this kind of stuff, while still having a bit of fun messing around with some code, if that floats your boat. Mm. Anybody else have any advice on that? I think that's, yeah, I think that's good advice, Jeff. I mean, I'm a, I'm a developer, become project manager, become a scrum master. Um, and I find, I mean, if, if you like writing status reports and rag reports and, and standing in front of a board and having your ass kicked uh, week after week, then yeah, whatever floats your boat. But um, <laughs> I was much more interested in kind of the, the looking after the team, the people management, um, helping them resolve their, their problems. Uh, uh, although I was a developer, I, I wasn't one to, to say, right, this is the way you should be doing it, guys. It's like, okay, tell me how you're going to solve this problem. What do you need from me to help you solve the problem? What resources do you need? Who do I, who do I need to tell to get off your backs and allow you to do stuff? That kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, as, as, I, as I said in the chapter, um, it depends what you want to do as a, as a project. If you want to be a traditional um, waterfall type project manager, there, there's loads of stuff out there. Uh, I, I personally would say stay the hell away from prints, but uh, each to their own. It's interesting, Mike, you were talking about the, the ass kicking that you used to get as a project manager. And I think it goes back to what Paul was saying about being careful about the organisation you work for, because that sounds like a, a cultural thing rather than necessarily all project managers are in the firing line all the time. Well, just, just look at The Apprentice. I mean, I, I, mean, I don't watch it. But some of you probably still watch The Apprentice. The idea that the project manager is the one on the line, right? They're the most likely to get fired, but they're also the most likely to get the glory. Yeah. And, and that, that, is a, that is a cultural baggage that comes along with the term. But it's sort of, as Mike was hinting at, it's, it's kind of old school because the responsibilities in a, in a more agile environment aren't there anymore. But that doesn't mean that there are, that doesn't mean that's the only way. Right? So there are other, other places where project managing will have kind of accountability, they will have responsibility, and that's arguably the right thing. Um, so, so finding those environments is, is key to making sure you're not a fish out of water. That's terrible. That's good. You're in the right pond. Jo Josh is asking why, why stay away from prints? I, 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 Mike was probably half joking about that. <laughs> it, it's not as useful if you're going to be operating in an agile environment because it's very structured, very formulaic. It's, um, it's the whole premise of prints is wrong. It's projects in controlled environments. It's like, who the hell works in a controlled environment? You know, well, all good environments are, are out of control. <laughs> yeah, so cases, that, that is a hell of a lot more effective and appropriate than others, but there are two variables that will affect no matter what environment you're in. One is people. Okay? The people add a level of complexity to any environment, how controlled. And the other is technology. Because technology is always evolving and always advancing. It's never, it's never stays the same, it's never predictable. So you're always going to have elements of unknown. And prints can cope with unknown, but it can't cope very well with unknown ones. So I, I'm of the, so I, I went I to actually go on the training course again, but I studied the print stuff. And you I think had a choice, didn't you, Jeff? You had a choice between Print 2 and Scrum. I made a choice. So I was booked on a Print course back in 2002. And it was so basically, I was a project manager, so I needed to get a qualification. So my boss said, Right, you're going on the Print 2 qualification. And it was in uh, somewhere. I don't know. So I'll say you. Somewhere in the UK, and um, and it was it cost I'll say fifteen hundred quid. And I happened to find that there was a certified Scrum Master class in Boston, Massachusetts, that with the flights <laughs> and the certification came to less than the Prince Two course. So I said I can get a project management certification cheaper than the one that you're sending me, and just like people's brain. Flags up when you hear their name, 
when BT heard the word cheaper, they didn't hear anything else. It's cheaper? Brilliant. Do it. So I managed to get uh, my CSM instead of going on my Prince 2. But while studying for it, I think there's a lot that you can take from it. As long as, I think you can take a lot from you know, anything, as long as you're not looking to apply it religiously. Yeah. So there's a lot in there in terms of organization, in terms of critical path, in terms of dependency management that you could probably take out and apply in different circumstances. We had a lot of resistance back in BT in the day um, saying, you know, about Scrum's lack of governance and things like that and saying, well, Prince, Prince has governance. And it was a long time ago, Jeff, but I remember we did a piece of work where we just literally mapped one to the other. I think we went through the whole Prince framework or the, 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 uh, the, the Prince methodology and we mapped every... <laughs> And we and we mapped every stage gate, every process point to an equivalent part of the Scrum framework. Showed it to the auditors, and they kind of went, "Oh, okay," and then and that got got them off our back for a long time. Um, it can do the same things, you know. It's it's not it, it can handle them, but Prince just tends to be more heavyweight and more time consuming, and it comes with a big old man. It probably still just does come with a big manual as well. One of the first things it said, I, I, I can't, because they have different versions, but basically the PM bot, the project management body of knowledge is what I think Prince 2 was assessing on Big Book. But right at the start of that, it used to, I don't know whether it still does, it used to say, only use as much of this framework as we need. Yeah. But what we found was that if there was something in there, then it gave somebody an excuse for it to be used. So it, always too much framework, always too much process was being used. Um, and it, it, it stifled not just innovation, but delivery as well, because there were so many stage cases. And so on. But yeah, I don't want to... I, I think I hate safe more than I hate prints. I, I was going to say, do, do, you, do you feel that safe has replaced prints as... Yeah, in many ways. As, as an, a, an overblown framework? And I'll tell you why, Duncan, because... Prince nails its colours to the mast. To me, it is what it says it is. And it makes no apologies. Whereas safe is waterfall in agile clothing. It's pretending to be agile and it's nowhere near. There you go, ladies and gents. You heard it there. It's been recorded, Jeff. So I said that with a finger. <laughs> that's gotta be all over that's <laughs> gonna be all over the internet tomorrow. Jeff Watts quoting that. Yes, Nick, a way of selling very expensive training courses and certification courses. Yeah. But certainty sells, doesn't it? That kind of thing. So, you know, recipes sell. People love those things. It's very attractive to the right type of people. Yeah. Anything else? Anything else? Any you got questions? Any other topics? Throw another any other curveballs in there. Well, I wouldn't mind uh, looking back to you remote teams uh, topic. Yeah, just yeah. you, uh, earlier on, you said that you turned down a gig because because uh, uh, it was a, a team that were having difficulties, but it sounds like they were a team that were, had always been remote, maybe. Um, now, and you said, you know, if you've got a team that's established and then they go remote, it, it can work. I guess a lot of us probably going to be working with teams that were created during all of this and, and they're never going to be together. So I guess the question is, how do we help them? I know, I know you wouldn't necessarily take that job off. So or, or you, might, you might, you might not, but what, what would you do if you were a working team where they were spread across the country or several countries and they were engagement issues? So I, I, I was slightly facetious when I said I turned away. Okay. So the more accurate thing, more accurate description was I told the client that they would not get value for money spending that money with me. They should save that money. Um, and as it turned out, they've waited. Restrictions have changed. We've now got it set up in person. But what would I, so I, I gave you that clarification because my default response is the art of the possible. So meet whoever it is that you're working with, where they are, and do the best you can. So, and, and always look to get better. 
So the, 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 the caveat, it's not really a caveat, but I suppose the critical variable there is does that team want to make the best of that situation? Uh, and I, I think for most teams that have been hired into it, yeah, they probably do because they've, they've bought into this with, they've gone into it with eyes wide open. Um, there was, um, I can't, uh, forgive me, I can't remember the, the full name, but there's a, there's a retrospective tool, which is a very short exercise, but it basically asks people um, whether they feel, whether they turned up to this retrospective and feel like a prisoner or a tourist or whatever. And I think if, if you've got people who are remote and feel like a prisoner, it's much harder to help them. Mm. Um, and it's much harder to help everybody else. So I think it's definitely possible, don't get me wrong, it's definitely possible to have a really fully functioning team, fully remote, because we've been part of them ourselves. We've seen it even before the pandemic, we've seen it. It's a lot harder. It takes a lot longer. It requires more effort and energy from everyone. Um, but with that kind of attitude that you've got there, David, of how can I help them? You've just increased your chances of success. I've got a question, if I may be so bold. Okay. So, uh, my team has been established during the pandemic. Um, I want to know what everyone's views are on being a wee bit dictatorial. I don't like the use of that word in this scenario, but I've forced my team's hand to get them to try it. So, for instance, I've said to them all, my expectancy is at least one day a month, we will all be together in a place that works for the majority because they're all over the place in, in the UK. But without that nudge, it wouldn't be happening. So I work for a bank. Um, and we are going back hybrid. So the expectancy from the board is two slash three days a week. But that's up to you what those two, three days look like. So to get my team together and start collaborating, do the odd retro face to face instead of a Miro, I've said, and I've given them two months notice, but from March for the rest of the year, first Tuesday of the month, we're going to be together. So ordinarily, you'd let the team decide, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what's your views on how I've approached this? Without, without knowing more about the team, I, I, I can't give you a, a brilliant answer. My, my instinct knowing you is that you've, you've sensed the room and that, that that kind of would have been welcomed. So there are some there are some teams at some point who, and this could be a, quite a touchy subject for some teams. This could be quite a, almost a taboo conversation. You've heard, I'm sure you've heard the idea of the silent majority, where the, the few that complain fill the air, and you know, everybody else is. Oh, I don't really want to have an argument about it, so I should have to stay quiet. But as soon as one person says, "Hold on a minute, I got." I've got a different need here, or I've got a different perspective. And other people say, yeah, okay, maybe, maybe I can, maybe I can join forces. I've got someone on my side. Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea of just putting something out there, uh, I, I guess my instinct would be, if I was going to do something, would be to almost put my, my feelings out there and say that I, I find it really difficult never seeing people. I really miss the connection. I really miss being able to, to actually think things through and talk things through with other people. I would really value seeing you all every now and again. Does anybody else feel the same? You're quite right though, Jeff, that I did read the room and that is why I've waded in before the silent majority had their voices because I knew who they are and I know it's coming. So I kind of went in before they had the opportunity to wreck it. Do you think they will try and sabotage it when it happens, Sarah? Um, one or two, maybe. And I know, oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. 
but I'm hoping that the, the being together for the remainder will outweigh that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I can imagine scenarios where you could take the, this, this is going to happen. You could take the, this is going to happen because I would like this to happen because um, please do this for me. There are lots of different ways of, of of floating something, lots of different ways of making a decision. But so, sort of, you know, I, I focus a lot on what makes a team a real team. And one of the things that I see makes a real team is every one of that, every member of that team will put themselves out a little bit yeah. for the needs of their teammates. Not all the time, but sometimes. And if something, if getting together was really, really important once a month was really, really important to one of my teammates, even if it was just one, I would feel a really crap teammate if I vetoed that. And also the other thing I was going to mention is around without, without treading this very thin line, fine line here between um, to, into manipulation, but, but trying to look at other instances where other team members have done something else to help someone else out other instances or examples completely unrelated as a team in a retro or talking about bringing it up in a retro instances in the last sprint where we have gone out of our way to make someone else feel better or to make to allow and then that 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 draws out other instances where it's nothing to do with with being being in a room together but we've helped each other out or we've done something that we didn't want to do to make someone else feel better or to, or to, to make someone else's day go go a bit smoother and if the teams can start agreeing on the things that they've done in the past, it won't seem like such an outlandish thing to, to do it again in the future. Different questions can get different answers. So um, as, a, as a brief example, you know, asking for a vote, how many people want to come in once a month? And you might get 50-50. Um, asking, Mike, would you, would you join everybody in coming in? once a month for our get together. I know you don't particularly want to, but would you do that, Mike? Directly asking you. Uh, maybe saying to Mike, what would it take for you to agree to come in once a month? Different questions, different answers. And so one thing I know you're very good at, Sarah, is reading the room. Um, so, yeah, just these things will make sense to me. It's going, to, it's going to be lots of these conversations, and I think it's just another part of our working agreements as a team. If they don't come, Sarah, I'll, I'll join you. Just tell me where it is. I'll come, <laughs> I'll come and join you. You'll be so welcome, you know. <laughs> cool. Um, we, we, we were told we had an hour with you, and I think we used that hour. Cheers, all. And that's it. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bottoms up. Cheers, everyone. Cheers.